Okay. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, Brian, Brian did a great job uh, with the overview of Gutenberg, just kind of look, looking, peeking under the hood a little bit um, to see what uh, types of, you know, functions and um, JavaScript objects and everything are available to us to do Gutenberg development. My goal with this um, second half here is to uh, provide some practical examples. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to uh, show like a few scenarios, I mean, a few examples of like, let's say client ABC came to you and said, I want a Gutenberg block that does X, Y, and Z. How would we build that start to finish? Like what tool would we use to scaffold that out and provide this like build tool for us? Um, we'll get into what, why that's necessary in a few slides here. So what tool would we pick for that? Um, through to how would we actually code up the block so that they show up in the WordPress admin and then function like the way that this client is asking for. So we're going to do that um, twice if we have enough, enough time. We'll do it once with this static call to action block and then a second one with this um, dynamic block that will go reach out to the um, WordCamp Detroit site, the, um, the REST API endpoint to grab its latest posts and then shoot those into the page dynamically. So anytime there's a new post published, it was always show the most recent content. Um, so that's what we're, we're going to dive into here. Um, my name is Kellen Mace. I'm there to do my intro at the beginning, so like Brian, I won't spend too much time, but I work for a company called Web Dev Studios, um, and I, my Twitter handle is there. So at this point, I'll take a brief, brief pause to send out my slides. Shazam, okay. Um, so if you had a... For those of you who want to follow along with the slides, or if you want the... Um, the code repository as well that we're going to be working on. I have all the finished, the two finished blocks that we're going to work on. I have that um, this GitHub link right there. So if anybody uh, wants to go to that site, you can grab both of them right there. All right. So with that, we'll keep rolling. So we'll start off with uh, talking about those real world code code challenges I mentioned, like what those are, what they're all about. So this is the first request that we got from our client here. So client request number one: You're the developer. You're on deck. It's up to you to implement this, right? The client, super cool client, as a matter of fact, <laughs> came to you and said, I want to spread the word about WordCamp Detroit on my site. I'd like a Gutenberg block that I can use as a call to action. It should include the option to select an image, have an area for rich text below that, and I want the whole thing to link to a URL that I choose. All right, so some of you, if you've been doing um, WordPress development for a little bit, you've probably built things like this before, using tools like you know, advanced custom fields or um, you know, pick list or CMB2, things like that, right? Um, but, and those you know, work great and have for years. Uh, the benefit that we get doing this in Gutenberg, though, is that we get a live preview um, of this data. So, so the user, as Brian mentioned, it's more of a true what you see is what you get. So instead of just filling in a few fields in like an advanced custom fields you know, meta box and, and then guessing at like, I hope this looks looks right in the front end. Let me go check. You have to save it and then go to the front end to actually get some, some real feedback, right? With Gutenberg, the advantage is um, as we're editing it in the admin, that little preview that the um, is working on, it's live updating. So what it looks like right, like right there will be what it looks like on the front end of the site. So it makes for this really great editing experience. In my opinion, it's going to make WordPress, um, help WordPress to stay competitive with some of these other platforms um, that are coming about uh, due to this really rich like editing experience that Gutenberg is going to provide for us. So, so that's the first, the first challenge that we'll code up today. Um, it's going to look like this. So this is the use. So they've chosen this white image. They plot that right there. And then below that, they get a little rich text field. So they have like entered one text here, hit enter to create a new paragraph, entered another line here. And then behind the scenes, they'll have one other field to specify a URL. So if anybody clicks on this banner here, this call to action, it will then link them to whatever URL the client specified. So that's the first thing we're going to build. The second one um, that we'll get to after that is this one. Again, super cool client. They were so impressed with you the first time, they came back again. This time, they want you to build a dynamic block. So we're stepping it up a little bit. And I'll, we'll get into the difference between those two. Brian mentioned it, but we'll reinforce it. So the client comes back again and said, I'd, like, um, I'd also like a block that pulls in the most recent WordCamp Detroit blog posts. Just their titles and links to them would be great. 
Um, I'd like to be able to control how many posts are displayed and my designer has provided you with an SVG that we'd like to use for the blocks icon in the WordPress admin. Um, for whatever reason, they, they have a certain icon they think their team will recognize well and they've provided that as an SVG. So they want in, that in the little Gutenberg block chooser you know, tool. They want us to use that icon for them. Um, so this one's a little different, right, because we can't just uh, take what the user has, the values they've given us in those fields and just save them to the database and call, call, it, call it done. Because this one, we want this to be, um, to be dynamic and to pull in the blog post. So if five minutes from now, WordCamp Detroit publishes a new one, anytime anybody reloads that page, it's there. It's going to show that, that new block for us. So we'll see like, how that's even um, possible. So that's what we're going to uh, accomplish with the rest of this session and then the next one as, as well. Um, so that second, that second challenge then uh, for the dynamic block, that one, the list of posts, it'll just look, look like this, right? So they'll be able to control like how many are shown, and it'll just be, you know, anchor tags, links to those blog posts um, that, that folks can click on this on super cool clients website. All right, so where to start? If we if you were to task with, with this to put these two boxes together, where would you even start? Right? Um, there are a few ways uh, that you can do this. One is to roll your own WordPress plugin. Um, so those of you who are familiar with you know writing a new plugin, you could start um, by doing that. Absolutely. Uh, but there are some challenges there with because we're using all this modern JavaScript tooling, it gets pretty darn complex. So we'll visit that in a minute. Uh, next one is you can use WPCLI. That stands for Command Line Interface. So if you're somebody who's comfortable on the command line, there's a command to build these blocks. Um, so we'll see like how that how that goes, ups, upsides and downsides there. Last one is um, create this tool called Create Guten Block. Um, it's it's a really great tool, and we'll talk about the pros and cons of that, that one as well. So I'll go through each of those real quick here. First option uh, I mentioned is roll your own plugin. Right? So this one, um, in order to do this, you must be familiar with configuring Webpack um, and a number of NPM modules to set up the build process. If that sounds like a little foreign to you or something, like something you haven't done before, be prepared to spend lots of hours do, doing that. Uh, it, takes, it takes quite a bit to you know, to configure all the stuff and wire it up um, to produce the, uh, the resulting JavaScript and CSS files that would be sent to the browser. There's a lot, lot to that, all right? Uh, and beyond that, you would also um, be responsible for managing any those dependencies yourself going forward. So both Webpack itself, itself as, as well as any NPM modules you're using to, to build this whole um, app that we're gonna talk about, if those like have version updates or need to be swapped out or one of them is deprecated, like it's up to you to swap those out, right? So this can become a little cumbersome and requires a lot of knowledge to do that. So I would recommend against that if you're not super, super comfortable. Cool, okay, this session's almost done. What do I have, like a couple minutes? One minute, okay, cool. I'll go through um, just, just this slide and then we'll break to talk about the winner uh, that, I'm, that I'm gonna propose to you, which is the last tool. Next one is WPCLI. It does have a command, WP scaffold block, that will scaffold out a block for you. There are a couple downsides to that though. At this point, it doesn't support modern tooling like that whole Webpack build process um, I was talking about. Uh, this makes writing evenly mild com mildly complex blocks a little more cumbersome. Instead of writing them out so that they look like markup, you instead have to use some of the techniques Brian was talking about where you call this L function and pass it the type of element you want it to create. It doesn't even look like HTML. You just have to imagine that it's creating that after the fact. It makes things difficult. So I would advise against, against that. And then you can't use the majority of pre-built React components you'll come across on the web. Because most folks who use React, which as Brian said is the technology underlying um, Gutenberg, most folks who use that use this JSX syntax I'm talking about. So if you're abandoning that and you're going to for the WPCLI route and not you know doing any anything extra like the tooling and stuff we talked about, um, you're not going to be able to use any of their libraries. All right. So what we'll do instead, what I'll recommend to you is using this Create Guten Block tool. Um, so we'll break now. Is that good? Okay. We'll break now and then we'll talk about like the perks, why we've chosen that tool, and then proceed with like um, actually spinning up a new WordPress plugin using this, and then building our blocks from there. Our two uh, two um, example blocks from super cool client, right? The first one was our static one uh, for the call to action that they have a few fields to customize and then that second dynamic one 
where they'll be, it'll be able to reach out to um, the WordCamp Detroit site, site and then generate a list of blog posts. And that one will be, you know, update um, every time there's a page reload. It'll grab the data fresh. All right, so we'll break for that and then I'll meet you back here in, in a few. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Is anybody um, joining us now that wasn't in the previous session? Yeah, okay, a couple. Cool, I'll do a little five second recap then what, what we're doing today. Um, so this morning, uh, Brian Richards, my companion here was um, kind enough to do like an intro to, to Gutenberg, like some of the underlying tech and functions and stuff like that. And for the second half of the presentation here, um, we're trying to do uh, some practical examples. So we'll do some live coding of like, here's how to build a few Gutenberg blocks start to finish. If you were asked to do this today, how would you even do that start to finish? Um, so that's what I'll be addressing. Um, so for our real world code challenges, we had super cool client come to us and said that they want call, one call to action block that's gonna look something like this when we're done. They can choose, select uh, an image, some text, and then a URL to link to. Then they came back, they were so impressed with us for, from that first block, they came back and said, I'd also like a block that pulls in the most recent WordCamp Detroit blog posts. So we're gonna create a second block that looks like this. It just outputs um, the posts from WordCamp Detroit. And this is always uh, dynamic data. So if WordCamp Detroit, five minutes from now, publishes a new blog post, anytime anybody hits this page, it'll pull in that, that new post. So that, we'll uh, take a look at how to do both of those. In the previous session, I talked about like, how do you even get started then building these Gutenberg blocks? And the answer is you need some kind of WordPress plugin to provide those. Um, so our options were roll your own plugin, uh, which requires a lot of knowledge for how to configure Webpack and a number of NPM modules. It gets, be prepared to spend like hours and hours doing that. Another one is to use WPCLI, but out of the box, it doesn't come with the, that modern tooling either. So the solution I was recommending is use, using this tool uh, called Create Guten Block. Um, it's similar to, if anybody's familiar with Create React app, if you've ever dabbled, dabbled in React, um, it was painful for a while building anything in React because you had to do this, this whole tooling setup I'm talking about. You had to do this all yourself. Um, and it was very cumbersome. So the uh, engineers at Facebook created this library that's a single dependency um, called create React app. So if you run that one command, it will create uh, a new React app for you. And it manages all the dependencies that, that your app requires on are kind of hidden behind the scenes and all you have to worry about is that one dependency. So make it super easy and you have nothing to manage. When Gutenberg hit the scene, um, this guy Ahmad Owais, who's a WordPress core contributor, really active in the community, he created, he was inspired by Create React App and created this really similar tool called Create Guten Block. And the idea is the same. This thing only has a single NPM dependency, so you don't have to worry about like setting up this real, super complicated build process. Um, this developer toolkit like does all that for you. So I really recommend it. This is what we're using at my company, WebDev Studios, for our internal Gutenberg block um, plugin that we've built. So what it does is it configures Webpack, Babel, ES Next, um, ES Lint for linting, React, SAS, and so on, all for you, so you can get started building blocks right away, instead of configuring how all of those um, things work by yourself. And I have the link there um, on GitHub as well. Before we proceed, also I should mention, if you were in the first session, um, if you want to follow along with the slides right here, I've, I just uh, tweeted a link to the slides, as well as this um, GitHub repo, where you can see the finished blocks. So the call to action block, and then also that recent blog post one, um, they're all, both in that repo. So if you just go to twitter.com slash Kellen Mace, um, you can find both of those. All right, so with that, this is our chosen tool then, so what I'm going to recommend to you. So with our next phase of the presentation here, we'll talk about how do you do that then? If you, once you've chosen your tool, how do you create a new plugin using Create Guten Block? So that's what we'll cover next here. All right, so first, first one here is to create your new plugin. Um, so if you go to the, the, the Create Guten Block uh, GitHub page, I linked on the previous slide there, it'll tell you how to um, install that tool. It's really easy, there's only like one or two lines on the command line that you would need to run to get that installed. Once you've done that though, then you're ready to actually create a new WordPress plugin, have it scaffold out a new plugin for you. So first, before we do anything, build anything on top of Gutenberg, I would recommend having Gutenberg itself. Probably a good idea, right? So if you don't have that already in, on your WordPress site, I would just clone that down. Um, you can do this 
two ways. You can, uh, from the WordPress.org plugins repo, you can, in your WordPress install, you can go to add new and then add the Gutenberg plugin. Or you could, if you're f comfortable with git and the command line, you could run this command to clone it down. I recommend this method though, because if you get the one from WordPress.org, it doesn't include all of the source files. And those will become really handy. If you're, if you're going to be serious about building Gutenberg blocks, you'll want to look into this plugin because there's all kinds of examples, all kinds of pre-written blocks. So you can look at those and see what, how the core team does it and then kind of emulate that in your blocks. It's super helpful. So I'd recommend doing it this way and not getting it from, from .org, again, just so you have all the original source files for all, for all those blocks. All right, so once you have that, we can create the new plugin in your plugins folder. So whatever WordPress site you want to uh, get started on, you just run this one command right here. NPX create Guten block and then give it some kind of name. So for us, we're going to do uh, WC DET blocks. All right, and then let, next one, just um, run this command on the command line, CD, and then the name of that new block, just to go into that new folder that we've created. All right, so at this point, um, I'll start doing some of the live uh, coding. Live demos always go great, as you know, so if things break, I apologize. Has it. I'll try not to let that happen as best as I can. All right, cool. So here's my local site. I have this WordCamp Detroit site, and this is where we're going to scaffold out a new plugin and build our blocks, all right? Um, so on the command line, I've done, all I've done so far is just what I mentioned on the previous slide, where I ran that npx create Guten block and I gave it a name, right? I get some output here. It says, you know, creating, and then uh, the directory is called that, and then all done. Go build some Gutenberg blocks, it says, right? And then it has a few recommendations at the end that this create Gutenblock tool outputs. Um, it says, get started. Sorry, the screen's a little cut off, isn't it? It says, get started. We suggest that you begin by typing and then CD uh, the name of that folder. So you get in, go into that folder and then npm start. Let me get this where we can see it. There you go. There we go. Okay. All right. So, um, so we'll do what it's suggesting. We'll do we'll do cd in, into that directory and then uh, npm start. All right. So here I am. I'm inside of my newly created um, plugin that the create Guten block has scaffolded out. So now I want to run npm start. It'll start the, the build process. Um, so it'll look for any file changes, and then whenever, whenever I make any, ch any changes, it'll run Webpack again and turn all of my React and JSX and ES Next, all these crazy terms, it'll take all of that and turn it into the JavaScript file that gets sent to the browser and, and um, shows up there. So here it is. It says the f it, it was compiled successfully the first time, and now it's watching for changes. So from here on out, any changes I make, it'll continue building that. Um, so if you want to see exactly like what we're even talking about here, what that create Gutenblock thing has done for us, this is what my site looks like right now. So if I go into um, that, that particular plugin that we just created, this is what it does for us here. So uh, there's one, one file. Sorry, let me. Sorry, I had, I had pulled up our finished example, but not the new example that we're going to build out. <laughs> that was fast. Both will be important, but all right, cool. Back on track now. All right, so this is what that create Guten block has created for us. Um, it gives you this plugin.php, which is very, very simplistic. You'll recognize this if you've ever built a WordPress plugin, just our usual headers on top there. And it just requires this init file that, that um, kicks off the rest of the plugin. If we look at init then, so source init, this is that file that it calls right right here that it requires. If you look in here, it's calling um, in queue block assets and it's calling um, this file that is, so these are the block assets for both the front end and back end. So here's a CSS file that's used in both places. And this one says in queue block assets for the back end editor only. So this is only needed in the WordPress admin and we're just loading up the JavaScript files Right, right here, and the CSS file as well. So that's it for init. 
So what this uh, tool does for you is it takes everything inside of so the source folder right here, any, any blocks um, that you may create here, it'll take all, all of that code, it'll bundle it up, and it'll produce three files in the end that it puts into this dist folder. Dist stands for like distributable files, or the files that will be distributed to the browser. So what it does for us is, in the end, it just creates these three files that we send to our WordPress site. Um, it sends blocks.build.js, editor build.js, and then style build.js. So two of those are used only in WordPress admin, because you only, only need them as you're editing the file, and then any that are needed on the front end um, would be in the this style CSS file is included on the front end as well for any styling that block needs. All right, um, so that's what the tool is going to do for us. It's going to create anything we build and uh, we create in source. It's going to ultimately create these three files, and it's going to listen for any changes. So like I said, so any change we make to things in source, it'll detect that. It'll build these new files and then spit them out right there. Um, so if we just reload the page, we'll see our changes right away. All right, so with that said, um, let's keep trucking. All right, so we've done this so far. We've created our new plugin, and we've moved into that directory and taken a little look around to see what's there, right? Next here, there's a few housekeeping and customization things I recommend. Um, so for whatever reason, this framework names the main plugin, uh, the main file plugin.php, um, which if you've been around the WordPress space for a while, like the best standard practice is usually to give it to the same name you know, as the plugin, plugin folder. So that's what I like to do. So I'll do WCDET blocks. I'd recommend doing that instead of just like plugin.php. So I renamed it to that. Um, next one, add a check for the core Gutenberg plugin. If Gutenberg is not active, then display an admin error message and deactivate our plugin. Uh, that's something that this framework doesn't do out of the box either. As I mentioned here, it just you know, re requires that file right away without even knowing if Gutenberg is even act active yet. Um, so that's something I would recommend adding as well. I have some code we can paste in to do that. All right, um, so we'll spend too much time on this, but we're just saying when the plugins get loaded, we're going to call this function right here. It will check if the register block type function exists. Um, if it does not, then we're going to display an admin notice right here that says, for Camp Detroit, uh, Gutenberg blocks requires that the Gutenberg plugin is activated, and then we're going to deactivate our plugin. Since it has Gutenberg as a hard dependency, right? It can't work without it. Um, if that's not true, though, if this code doesn't run because that function does exist, then it will just proceed on to require the file that we need and that we need and load up the plugin. All right. Um, so I'll just grab all of this and paste it into our new plugin that we have right here. So instead of just the require, I would recommend pasting this in. So I'll save that and now let's give that a test in in our browser. So I'll go to the admin. Let's try this out. We'll go to the plugins page. All right, um, so here's the core Gutenberg plugin. So watch this, I'll try to deactivate that and then I'll try to um, activate ours. This is the new plugin we created there and it shouldn't let me. Yeah, so I get, instead I get this you know, message here that says, sorry, Gutenberg is required, please install it. Um, so I do it in the reverse order then if I, if I activate Gutenberg and now I try, it still doesn't work. <laughs> Oh, WDS, you're right. Dang it. The live demo is going slow. All right, so for the sake of time, we will not do that. Cool. So that's in the GitHub repo. Um, it's coded the correct way there. So anyways, for, <laughs> for now, we'll just leave it like this. All right, the other housekeeping items I had, I would recommend doing are, uh, we've already taken the tour, so we know that what these two folders are here, so I'll skip that. I would create a blocks folder inside of source, since we plan on creating more than one block. Um, with, this, with this tool, what it does is, inside of source right here, it just has the example block living right there. Um, but this can get a little confusing if you plan to add, if you need any other directories. So like my, um, for my companies, 
um, plugin that we use for Guten Blocks. If we look inside of source right here, like we have blocks where we've nested all of our blocks. We have components, which are some things that are shared by a few of the blocks, just like kind of shared components in there. Uh, we have a SAS folder with some like global style stuff in there, a template tag. So anyways, if you, if you start dumping all your blocks right here, you don't really have any room to have any other directories like that. So anyways, I would recommend like nesting at one level um, more deeply. So inside of source here, I would create a new folder and call it blocks. And then just this example block that the plugin provides to us, we can put that inside of there instead. All right, um, <clears throat> all right, and then put, so yeah, we just did this, create a new block folder and then put the example block inside of that. All right, after that point, um, we'll need to make one change. Let me see. All right, and then inside of that example block, um, it comes with a block.js file. That one I would recommend changing to index.js, and I'll show you why here. So here's the example block. You can see the name that it comes with is block.js, but that's kind of non-standard. If you look inside of Gutenberg, all the main um, the main file for every um, for every Gutenberg block is named index.js, so not block.js, and that makes it easier when you actually import them. So see this file blocks.js. This tell this is how Webpack knows where to look for all of your blocks right here. So see how we had to go down to the file right here. We had to say block.js. If you use index as a file name. You don't even need any of this. You can just you can just say import block, and that's it. Um, in our case, though, because we nested it one level more deeply, we would have to say blocks, and then block. But again, you don't need that like index.js or whatever the file name is. You can leave that off if you've chosen to call it index. So we'll do that as well. So I'll save that. And I didn't mention either that um, as this tool is running, it will report out on any errors that occur. So here's one right here. So can't resolve, oh, I typed block block instead of blocks block. There we go, save that. Uh, thank you, that's what I forgot, okay. Index, gotcha. there we go, okay. So you can see it turned to green here, compiled successfully. So that means when it went to look inside of blocks here, and then further inside of that block, and we didn't give it any file name, it's going to assume, oh, you want index, since that's the main one. So this is what was actually loaded up. All right, so that was it for just like how I would recommend customizing um, this tool right here. Um, so from here on out, we'll get into the, the good stuff, how to actually build this stuff. So two um, commands we, you would need to be aware of. Uh, one we already re are running right now, it's that npm start one. That's one that just listens for changes and rebuilds the, the plugin. There's a slightly different one though, npm run build, and that's to build a produ the production code. So I think that um, just like minifies it and does a, does a few things that you would want for production, but not necessarily want for development. So those are the two commands to be aware of. Right now we're just running the first one. All right. Um, the so the naming convention I recommend, if you're going to use this, um, this tool to scaffold out like a new, a new plugin and create a new block, um, this is what I've come up with for like a good naming convention here. So we already talked about index.js. That's the only file that's required since that's where the block is, is actually registered um, and WordPress can, can work with it. Beyond that though, you can have any of these others that are needed. So I recommend doing like editor.scss for styles for the backend only, icon.js if it has an SVG icon. Uh, if you remember, one of our requests from the client said they did have a custom icon, so we'll need to do that. Render.php, if this is a dynamic function that we need to render um, every time to be, to be different, like our second block we'll build, we need some kind of PHP file that has a callback function whenever this block is output. This is what determines um, what gets rendered on the page. And lastly, style.css, styles for the front and back end. So, um, all these are like how it's done in the core Gutenberg plugin, except render.php. Um, they do it a different way, but for our purposes, like I think this is a good naming convention. So we'll stick with that. All right, so how to create a static block then. Um, so before we move on to this, let's just take one look at that example plugin that ships with this. So if you recall like blocks, you know, we created that directory and we move this example block that comes with create Gutenberg block there. Let's take a quick look at that. So, do I have all the correct things activated finally? Not yet. There, now I think I do. Okay, and we will rename 
our function here is to make it more clear. We'll do Yep. All right, give it a better name so it's a little more recognizable. But we should go be good to go with our with our blocks here. All right, so I'll go to posts um, and then add new, and we'll take a look. So I'll type example block. Oh, hang on. Drone npm install. Come on. So Gutenberg's not active and I'm getting the error message at the top, so let me fix that real quick because we'll need that to proceed. Why is it taking forever? I've already NPM installed. All I have to do is build it. It's working earlier today, of course. Now it's decided to stop. Um, dang it. Oh. I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to get rid of is that a good idea? Yeah. All right. Bear with me one sec. Sorry. grab the version for wordpress.org instead. <clears throat> this is the one I said won't have all those bundled um, uh, blocks inside of source. So I wouldn't re reference this, but we'll see if we can use it just for now for, to get this working. All right, that's looking good. Now what if I go to post? Add new. All right, we're in business. Sorry about that. Um, my, the core Gutenberg plugin I had wasn't building for some reason, so I just grabbed another copy of it. All right, so we'll keep rolling here. We'll say example block, block. All right, and from here, um, so you're probably familiar with this if you've messed around with Gutenberg at all, right? This is just the, the chooser where you can search for and click on like whatever block you're interested in. So we'll take a look at this one. See this um, uh, CGB block right here? This is the example one that comes with this create Guten block tool. So I'll click on that. You can see right here, I get this green, um, background div right here, it says hello from the back end. I'll click publish on that. We'll take a look on the front end to see what this looks like. Let me see. Save it as a draft, publish, yeah. Okay, there we go, so now it's published. So on the front end, you'll notice it's different, right? Now it's red and it says hello from the front end. Um, so we'll look at, you know, what, what controls those blocks, um, just as, as one base example. All right, so we'll take a look at this pre-built block right here before we do anything else. So here it is, the block that comes with this. Let's look at the index.js file. This is the one I said is like the main file, the only one that's required to tell WordPress, here's a new block. Um, this is what it looks like here. So you can see in this block, um, the author is, you know, importing the other style sheets right here. So style and editor. This is all you have to do. Webpack does all the rest. It knows, you know, what to do with each of those files and where to put them, which style sheet to include them in. All you have to do is a single import sta statement if you have any that you want to include. All right. Um, next, we're grabbing some um, objects, some things off of objects uh, that we need on the global WP object. Brian mentioned that in his talk. So in this case, we need this underscore underscore for any translations that we'll do. And we need the register block type function to do just that, to register a block. All right, and then here's the, that example block. 
the one we were just looking at here. This is how it works kind of behind the scenes here. Um, so you have to give it a title. So this one, this is the current title. We can give it new, new example block title, and now it will appear, appear as that in the admin. Uh, for the icon, you can use one of the dash icons. If you follow this link, all you need to do is um, just provide the slug for that, or alternatively, you can give it an SVG. We'll see how to do that in a little bit. Category uh, determines where it shows up in the admin. So when I go here to add a new block, see how there's suggested, blocks, embeds, shared, and so on. Blocks is just like the common area here. So see how it says common. So that just controls where you want this block to show up in that chooser. So in this case, we've chosen common. The keywords here are other things you can search for. If anybody searched for this, or this, or this, or whatever, um, in that chooser, our block would pop up. So there's other things that might be named. So all those are pretty straightforward. Next, we'll get into the two um, functional components that actually power this block. So the first one is edit. Um, it says, this edit function describes the structure of your block in the context of the editor, meaning the WordPress admin, all right? Um, so you can see what's happening here. It receives this argument called props, and then on, on that object, it has uh, something called class name. This is something Gutenberg gives you right off the bat. You can pass in other props if you want, but um, right off the bat, it gives you a few of them. One is the class name for the current block. So you have this container div with that, we're saying hello from the back end, um, and just a link here. So this is what you can think of this function as defining what's going to get rendered in the WordPress admin, what the editor is going to see here. If we go d down to the next one, though, this save function here, you can think of this one as what's going to be rendered on the front end of the site publicly for people, people to actually see. This is also what gets saved in the, in the WordPress database. So the process is whatever um, is defined in the save function here. When somebody like configures their block and then hits publish, you know, or they save that, what WordPress will do is it'll take everything in the save function and it'll, it'll save that to the database inside of the post content for this particular post. Then when um, this post gets rendered on the front end of the site, all that markup is there in the database, so that's what will appear on the front end of the site. So for this function, um, that's what it's all about, and there's just, in, in those style sheets, it just, defines that you know one of these should be red, the other should be green, just so you can kind of see the difference for like one when one is showing up and the other isn't. This block is pretty darn simple and it doesn't have any attributes. So usually, usually right here after keywords, you would specify the attributes. And we'll see what that's all about next. Brian mentioned um, attributes and what those are used for. But since this block is so simple and has like zero, nothing to configure, it doesn't actually need any attributes. All right, um, so that's it for the example block, it's a good, a good kind of starting point to get a feel for these. Um, let's create a new one though. So we'll dive into creating our static block. So this is that call to action we talked about. Remember, super cool client asked us to, to create that one. So what we'll do first is inside of our blocks folder, we'll create a new folder for our block um, and then we'll give it uh, an index.js file to. So let's get started with that. So inside of blocks here, I'll close our example one and we'll create a new one, a new folder. We'll call it, um, for MTT. Try to remember what I named it in my finished example. Okay, and then inside of that, we'll do a new index.js file. All right, and to get started here, I have a little boilerplate code that we'll use, so we don't waste too much time typing this stuff out. All right, so what I've, what I've typed in here is just pretty bare bones. It just calls in those two things we mentioned for translations and then for registering the block type. It has these fields, but they're all pretty, you know, pretty much blank, as you can see, and then an edit and a save function, and all it does for us is give us that container div with the class name. That's it. It's up to us to fill in the rest here. All right, um, so what should the first step be then? If we, if we want to create this block, um, I think we should give it uh, register it and give it a name, you know, fill out this section first, and then we'll dive in talking, talking about the rest of the stuff there. So, give me just a second, and I'll find my, oh, I just called it call to action in my, let me rename it so it matches my final, final example here. Okay, so the call to action is there, and then, 
All right, here's the finished version here. So what we'll do first is I'll steal these things just so we, you don't have to watch me retype all of them. There we go. So you have our, our namespace here, as Brian mentioned, to group together our blocks is WCDET. The block in particular is called call to action, giving it, giving it a name, giving it one of those dash icons. So it'll be like a, a megaphone icon. I'm saying it's just a common type of block. So that's where it'll appear in the admin. And then the other keywords, like other things I might, I think people might search for, I just said CTA, right? But you could um, choose some other ones if you want there. So I've completed all that. Now we can get into um, the edit and save. Uh, functionality as well as the attributes. Um, let's start with attributes. I think that might might be a good one. So we'll start with just the message first. I think it might be go be good to go back to what our block actually looks like. All right. So we'll start with this right here. This this little rich text area. That's what I'm calling the, the message. We'll start with how to build that first, and then we'll move on to the image and the URL ones as well. All right, so first, uh, we need this attributes object, and then we need this messages object inside of it. So I'll put that in our new block that we're building over here. Um, I'll put that right below keywords. All right, and then I need my closing brace. So here we are. We have, we're telling WordPress, here are our, our attributes. We're going to have one called message. This could have been named anything, but we're choosing to, to name it message. And then... Um, this type source and selector are some of the things that Brian went over earlier. Some of these are kind of hard to understand at first, but the more you work with it, you do get familiar with it. What we're saying here is, um, let me back up a second here. What WordPress has to do in the WordPress admin, if somebody is running Gutenberg, what it has to do in order to get things ready for, for them to start editing is it has to grab the markup from the database and pull some data out of it. Um, so what, what happens is this save uh, functionality function right here. If Let's say we have some uh, a rich text area up down there, like we have the, a few paragraph tags um, that exist in there. What WordPress will do when, this, uh, when the WordPress admin first loads up, it will grab this, the markup, right here from the database. And it'll try to pull out certain things from that. And it'll use that to populate our attributes. So we're saying, we're telling it, here's where you should look to get th those messages you should look in something that has a class of message. Right? And this is similar, if you're used to writing CSS, this is similar to just CSS selectors. So that would have been pound message if it was an ID or whatever. So we're telling WordPress, look at that particular um, element, and then we're telling it uh, the source, the thing we want to capture are, are its children, so like all those paragraph tags inside of that, and then type has to be array, because we're gathering more than one thing. All right? um, there are other types and other children, but we'll get to those for now. For this. This particular one, the message, um, this is what it, what it would need to look like. And there's documentation uh, for, thank you, um, for how to do that. Online as well. Okay. All right. Our time's running thin, so let's talk through. I'm going to paste in these other ones, and we'll talk through them. This and then save. All right, so here's where I where I ended up um, with this particular particular block. <clears throat> what did you say? Oh, thank you. Awesome, thank you. So here's why I ended up with this with this block. Um, the props that come into it that I'm pulling off are these ones. So class name, um, the attributes are right here. WordPress will pass those into you. There's this set attributes function it gives you as, as well that does just that. Whenever you call that, you're telling it, I want to set my attributes up here to something new based on some you know new data the user has entered, whatever else. It also gives you this is selected. Um, uh, Boolean to tell whether the current block is in focus or not. You can choose to show things based on that. Then I'm taking the attributes and pulling even more things out of that. All right. If this syntax looks a little funny, this is like um, ES6, so I would you know just read up on, on writing that. But just know that the, out of this attributes object, we're pulling out these three things. There's an uh, image ID, image URL, and image alt. So that would be in our call to action block. That would be this top image right here. All right, and then 
let's see. Let's go to the, the render function here, or the return function. So this is what's at, what actually should be shown in the WordPress admin here. So here's our wrapper you know, um, class name in the container right here. And then we're saying um, if there is an image, uh, if there's no image ID, uh, if the user hasn't chosen that, and again, I'm skipping ahead, so this would be, assume at this point we've, we've already um, included the attributes for, for the image. If that has not been uh, chosen, then we're going to show this. So there's this media upload um, component that, uh, that Gutenberg has inside of it, the core plugin. And they're saying um, whenever that's selected, whenever an image is selected, we're going to call this function right here that will update our attributes. Um, we, you give it a type and a, the value is whatever, whatever the ID is um, that was chosen for the last, last time an image was chosen, that's what we're going to pass in for the value right here. So that'll get up, updated anytime there's a new value. And then this render, you can just look into media upload to kind of see like how to, how to pass things into it. But just know that this is the standard way to select an, an image. So let me paste in all this stuff. All right, so if there's no image has been selected, we're going to show this media upload um, button right here. On the other hand, if an image has been chosen, then we're going to show that image at the top. Right here, here's my image tag, and I'm pulling in the URL for the chosen image, the alt text, and so on. We're going to say, um, if the current block is selected, then we want to go ahead and show this button that says, remove image. So if somebody clicks on the block and there's already an image there, we'll look at a button that says, remove image. So if they click that, they'll be able to remove it. Below that, I have a rich text field. This is what we started to build a minute, a minute ago um, before we jumped ahead. It says, you know, enter a call to act action message here. You can see the value, we're saying out of that attributes object, pull out the, the message from that, and that's going to be the value of this rich, rich text thing. If the user ever changes that, if they type in a new message, then we're calling that set attributes um, function that Gutenberg provides to us, and just sending it the new message. So it will, it will update um, the attributes. And if you're familiar at all with React, uh, it handles all the re-rendering of things for you. All you have to do is make sure like the, the attributes up there are in the state you want them in, if that makes sense. So at, at any point, um, you can just, if, if something's updated in, in the attributes, um, React will call like this edit function right here, it'll rerun everything in there. So anything that like was true before but now isn't anymore, it'll change that to, to you know, either show or not show, whatever you told it to do, it'll, uh, it'll handle all of that logic. Um, if you're used to like writing jQuery, for instance, in a WordPress context, this is kind of a departure from that. This is like m writing things more in more of a declarative way. So you just tell React, hey, if at any point this block is selected, when it, when it renders, display all this stuff. Or if at any point there isn't an image, display this thing, right? And then you, you, all you have to do is make sure that you are updating um, the image or the rich text or whatever it is, those attributes. Just up, update them when they should be act, updated, like when the user enters a new value. As long as you've done that, it will, ha it will run through this and handle you know, displaying the right thing on the screen at any given time. All right, so if it's selected, we're going to show this inspector controls thing in the sidebar that says um, that you can enter a call to action URL. So let's see what this looks like. I'll save that. I'll save that really quick, and we have to include it. All right, so here's call to action. Here's our index.js. Just a sec here. Carry through it. Okay. I knew I was in trouble with the live demos. Uh, let's see. I just move my finished block there. Hang on.
All right, I hope this actually works. So here's new post. Um, I'll add a new one. So here's that call to action if you're interested. When it's all said and done, this is what it looks like. There's our megaphone. There's our title we gave it. So you click on that. Um, this is what it looks like. So you can click, click you know, here, enter the call to action message. Um, let me see. I had that saved here. Field values. Here, we'll grab all this. That'll be our message for our upload image. We'll grab the logo. And then for the URL here, we'll link to this event. All right, so that was, remember in my code I said, um, ev everything I was rendering here, like the, the image, the remove button, or whatever else, but there was one section that said inspector controls. What that does is Gutenberg, any, any fields you put inside of the inspector controls, it, puts over here inside of this this side panel right here. So this URL I thought would be a good spot for that, right? Since there's not really like a, a nice natural place for it to go here. So the user would just like paste in their URL right here. So if they do all that and they hit publish, then we can go ahead and do this on the front end. And it looks like that. Um, so this background right here is just hard coded. Um, so you could you know, have yet another image upload field for them to choose a background if you wanted in addition to the foreground image to make it, make it easy, I just left that out. But uh, here's that you know, um, rich text that we had um, typed in right here. And then if you hover over, you can see it, it's linking to the right, to the right place. Right? So this is our static block right here. And then our save function is more, more simplified as you can see, because we don't need all those fields for like adding the image, removing the image, the inspector controls, all that stuff. We don't need any of that, so you can see it's a little bit uh, thinner here. So this would actually get saved to the database. WordPress will say it'll wrap everything in a div, first of all, but then in that link, right? So we have the whole thing ends up getting linked. We have our image at the top and then our message at the bottom here. And these values that it plugs in, like the URL, the alt, text, the message, whatever else, those ultimately come from those attributes, all right? So in your code, if you, again, you can think of it as um, when, when WordPress like loads this block up for somebody to edit it, it's taking the, all this stuff from the database and it's pulling the attributes out of that. So what it'll do, it'll look for uh, this class name. See how the class name is image right here? It'll look for the dot image selector if you told it to do so, and it'll pull out the source attribute here and the alt attribute, you know, grab those values and put those into the attributes, and then it'll only change them if the user sets them to something else. Likewise, it'll look for the message class and it'll pull out the children of that. Remember, that was the one we set to children because it can be like multiple paragraphs. So if you look um, at our attributes right here, it corresponds with that. So here's message, right? You're trying to look in this class for the children, and it's an array of those children. For the link URL, look in the dot link that we just saw a minute ago. The attribute is source that we're looking for, and it's one of, of its attributes. So that's what's going to pull out and put into link URL. And again, it's up to you to just update these whenever necessary using that um, set attributes function like this. So, right? So when anybody changes this field, we're saying take the new message and call set attributes and pass in that new message so that it gets updated then. All right, cool. So we're out of time, and we did one out of my two blocks. Um, so I apologize for that. If you're curious about the other one, though, um, I can sh I can show you that real real briefly. So here's here's the first one, and then the second one was going to be WordCamp Detroit latest post. Remember, the client wanted a special icon. So here's the icon that we've included here. That's another file. It's just icon.js right there. If you choose that, here's what it looks like. You get a list of the posts, and these. You know, recognize here, that's not from this site. This site is WordCampDetroit.test. It's pulling in the actual, actual post from the WordCamp Detroit site and then displaying them here. The user gets this little range control. So watch this on the fly. They can, they can change the number. You can see in between there's a little like fetching um, word for moment momentarily while it grabs those posts and then it pops them into view. So they can like dial this in to like the number of posts that they're interested in and get a live preview of what this really will look like right here. And then when they hit update, they can view this um, post on the front end. 
And here are those lists of posts right here that would link out to the WordCamp Detroit site, right? Um, that one, if you have more time, you can uh, look, look at the GitHub repo to see how that's done. Um, that one, because you can't, you can imagine for this, this block, because it can look different every time it's loaded up, right? That's, so this isn't something we can save to the database. So we had to do in that, what we have to do in that case is, so an index.js, remember I said the, um, the edit functionality right here? This one's more complex because uh, it has internal, internal state. So you can look at this later if you want. But in, inside the edit um, component here, we're doing a lot, a lot of stuff. But look at the save component. There isn't one. Right? We're, we're, we're passing null right here. And the reason is this is the, this is the markup that saved to the database. For our, in our case, there's none here. All we're doing is saving, saving one single thing to the attributes, which is number of posts. And the type is number. That's it. So if you looked in the database, you'd see one single little inline comment for this block that just said the user picked a number of posts and it was six. That's all it knows. It doesn't know anything else. And then it's up to us to define a callback in PHP then. So what you can do in PHP is say, hey, for the latest posts, its render callback function that you should use whenever it's being output on the page is this thing. It's called render latest post block. And that's this function here. Right, so it will try to get the number of posts. I have this fetch latest post function here, which will, will try to fetch them. So if you're interested in that, it uses WP remote get to like reach out to the WordCamp site and retrieve those posts back. And then it does JSON decode on them to turn them into something that PHP can easily work with. If that was successful then, uh, if we were able to get those posts, that array of posts right here, then we're um, outputting this markup right here. So it's saying for each of those posts that we grabbed as post, it's outputting a paragraph and then an anchor tag inside with that post's link and then that post's title inside of the link. So that's what ultimately results in, in this right here. So if I were to update this and say, hello, save, now when I reload this, you can see that showing up every time. So that's the benefit of, of having this, like, that callback method in PHP is you can have this look, look different on every page load if that's ever necessary for you. If it's not though, then you can go ahead and use that save function and save, save things to the database if you don't need this you know, dynamic function out here. All right, I'm a little over time, so I think that was about it. Um, there's a ton to cover with Gutenberg, but hopefully from that you at least got a sense of like what tool might be a good one to look at for that plugin that helps you like scaffold out your first block. And then the difference between a static one, um, like that call to action one we chose, you know, where there are a few options to customize, and then we're saving that to the database for WordPress to pull those attributes out and then resave them and all that. Difference between that and a dynamic one, um, like the one we showed here, right, where it gets a, the render callback is in PHP instead, and it can pull in different things um, every time it, it gets rendered like that. So. Hopefully that was helpful to you. Um, there's lots of resources, especially in Brian's slides. You have a lot of helpful uh, resources that you can check out if you want to dive into this stuff yourself. So thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it, everybody.